recording in progress. Okay. All right, so we're recording. Um, Hi to everybody who's here. Welcome to our second speaker series for our Marine Mavens group. Um, we're really excited to have this group of panelists joining us and speaking with us today about bringing the ocean to the public, about careers in marine science that are public facing, right? Bringing all of that information about the ocean and science and our connection with the ocean to, um, to everyone. So we're gonna start off first with um, Helen and Crystal. I think everybody who's in here right now has filled out the survey that we've been looking for. So we're going to skip over that part. Um, and Helen Roswodowski is going to go first. So I'm just going to read um, quick bios for you guys and then I'll let you jump right into it. Helen Roswodowski is a professor of history and a founder of the Marines Maritime Studies Program at the University of Connecticut, Avery Point. She graduated from Williams College and received her MA and PhD from the University of Pennsylvania in 1996. Her teaching includes environmental history, history of science, and public history, as well as interdisciplinary maritime studies courses. Her latest book, Vast Expanses, A History of the Oceans, 2018, demonstrates that the human relationship with the ocean began in evolutionary time and has tightened dramatically since then, aims to provide uh, since then and aims to provide a model for writing ocean history and argues that ocean histories must examine and historicize the technologies and knowledges systems that enabled and accompanied human interactions with the sea. Her book, Fathoming the Ocean, the Discovery and Exploration of the Deep Sea in 2005, revealed the simultaneous scientific and cultural discovery of the ocean's depths in the mid 19th century, won the his history of science Society's Davis Prize for Best Book Directed to a Wide Public Audience. She has written a history of 20th century marine science, The Sea Knows No Boundaries, in 2002, and a history of 20th century marine sciences supporting international fisheries policy. She has co-edited three volumes that have helped establish the fields of history of oceanography, Soundings and Crossings, Doing Science at Sea, The Machine in Neptune's Garden, Perspectives on Technology in the Marine Environment, and Extremes Oceanography's Adventures at the Poles. Helen has worked in the past both as a public historian and also in academia. She won the Ida and Henry Schumann Prize from the History of Science Society, was awarded the William E. and Mary B. Ritter Fellowship of the Scripps Institution of, Tech of Oceanography, and has received grants and fellowships from the Rachel Carson Center for Environment and Society, the Yukon's Humanities Institute, National Endowment for the Humanities, National Science Foundation, and the Smithsonian Institution. So that's Helen, who's gonna be speaking first, and I'm gonna read Crystal's too, because we're gonna roll right into Crystal after Helen. Crystal Rose is the curator of collections at the Mystic Seaport, overseeing various aspects of general collection of objects and art. She has managed the Mystic Seaport for Educators website and projects since 2010, and has held multiple roles over the years in both the collections and education department. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in history from the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, and a Master of Fine Arts in Historic Preservation from the Savannah College of Art and Design. Awesome. So those are our two panels to start us off. Um, and we're really excited to have you in here all about what you do and where you got to where you are today. Can I share my screen? Is that something that you can give me permission to do? Because I have a little PowerPoint because I like showing pictures. Yeah. Okay, right now. Let's see. Where is it? Share screen. Got it. Let's see. I've got one. I've got this one. Great. Okay. Well, I am super excited to be here today with all of you. Um, and 
I just want to let you know that uh, my students call me Professor Roz. You can call me that. You can call me Helen. Uh, anything uh, you want. Just don't call me late for dinner. Ha ha ha. Um, I today am a University of Connecticut professor, as you've just heard, and um, I am teaching and doing research, uh, especially animated by the uh, interest in making sure we pay more attention to historical relationships between people and oceans. And I'll try to explain a little bit more what that means. Uh, and I'll begin with a caveat that I am a terrible photographer. I hate having my picture taken. And these pictures from early on, I wouldn't even have them digitized anyway. So these are totally pictures of the places I'm talking about, but not, none of them are mine or of me. I'll let you know when it starts being me. Um, so my interest in the ocean began in what might seem like a strange place, uh, the shores of Lake Erie, which is one of the Great Lakes on our northern coast. And um, uh, the Great Lakes can have these enormous waves and Lake Erie in particular having, uh, being the shallowest lake can have these incredibly ferocious storms. There are lots of shipwrecks in Lake Michigan. Um, and I particularly grew up sailing small boats uh, like this one and living uh, near a uh, peninsula with seven miles of sandy beaches, like the picture on the bottom. So I felt like I lived in an oceanic kind of place, even though I was on a Great Lake. Uh, and and the, the, the kind of um, disruption to this uh, fantasy came when I was 11 years old and my parents took us to the Delaware coast. And I remember incredibly viscerally diving into the water and then abruptly standing up and being kind of outraged that it was salty, which I neither expected nor liked. So it was sort of this reminder that, that even though the Great Lakes are very oceany, they're not exactly like the ocean. Um, I continued uh, sailing all the way through high school. Um, I became fascinated with maritime culture, including so-called tall ships. Today, I would call them traditionally rigged vessels. And um, when I was a kid, the US brig Niagara was uh, located on a cradle up on land right next to the public dock downtown. And my family visited it every time we had visitors from out of town. Um, and then I watched very avidly uh, as uh, the uh, people associated with the new Erie Maritime Museum rebuilt the U.S. Brig Niagara so that it could sail. Um, and indeed, I got to sail on it once while I was in college. And later, I got to sail on it for a week as a sail trainee. And since then, Yukon Maritime Studies faculty and students have uh, been trainees on the Niagara. So uh, I think my relationship with the Niagara, Niagara has a lot to do with kind of one reason why I turned um, uh, in the direction I did. I also read Moby Dick more than once in high school, which I hear is not um, from my friend, the Melville Scholar, is not to be recommended, but uh, that probably also had something to do with it. So then I left home to attend college in a valley in Western Massachusetts in the Berkshire Mountains. Um, and to, somewhat to my surprise, I found there that I really, really missed the open vista of the lake and the beautiful sunsets. Um, I felt kind of hemmed in, especially for my first year. Uh, but then I, I came to really love college. I came to really love the mountains. Uh, and I, I, I kind of turned without much thinking about it to the study of biology, because I'd always liked science, um, maybe also because both of my parents were medical professionals. Um, my dad desperately wanted me to be a doctor. And uh, he was a little unhappy when I fell in love with Northern hardwood ecology, which he did not think was very practical. But all along, I took so many English classes that it very quickly became apparent that I might as well double major in English because I was more or less gonna do an English major anyway. Um, and just as a kind of um, caveat, I put a picture here of a bunch of books. Remember, I said, these aren't my pictures. There were no computers in my first year in college. I brought a typewriter to college and it was in my second year of college that my college built the first computer labs with Macintosh computers, um, which we used basically as word processors. I'm sure scientists had more use for them, but um, computers, never mind cell phones, were not part of my world for a long time. 
that's that's just to show you how old I am. All right. Um, so at some point about halfway through college, it became clear to me that I didn't want to be a scientist, but I really thought science was very important to society and I wanted to find some way to learn about that. And I stumbled on a class taught by a biology professor on the history of biology. And at some point that just hooked me and you know, I, I never really went, I never really backed off that. I found another history of science class taught by someone who had been trained as a historian of science. And then I took an independent study with that person to try to figure out if I might wanna to go to grad school in history of science. But before I got around to doing that, I found a study away program that I absolutely could not resist. Um, and I think you'll see from what I've said before, how it was that I could not resist. So C Education Association is a semester program in Woods Hole uh, that at the time was very well known for oceanography. Today, it's uh, very well known for lots of disciplines, including oceanography. Um, and although I was a science major and although I was interested in the oceanography, the, the not so secret secret is the real reason I went was to sail on a tall ship for six weeks including uh, in the cruise track I was on, two weeks of not seeing land at all. That was really what, what motivated me to go. Um, SEA was and remains an amazing educational opportunity. Uh, and if you're thinking about that sort of thing for your future, um, another program that is equally amazing and that probably the today me would like even better because it has a kind of public history and um, museum studies component is the Williams Mystic program. But, Anyway, I, I encourage you to study abroad or study away when you get to college, uh, however or wherever you do it. But there was one conversation aboard the RV Westward that in particular laid the foundation for what I did next. One day during Science Watch, our oceanography professor, whose name was Mary Farmer, I kid you not, um, just kind of casually said, all right, this is great that we're doing this, but this isn't how oceanography is done today. Oceanography is no longer done under sail on tall ships on long voyages. It's done on short voyages, very intensive uh, data collecting, and of course on powered vessels. And I remembered that comment several years later when I found myself in a history of science seminar in which we were studying field sciences. Before then, the history of science had been focused on laboratory science. And I kind of raised my hand and said, okay, I'll do my research project on the history of oceanography. And indeed, fast forwarding quite a bit, I ended up writing my PhD dissertation on the history of 19th century ocean sciences. And that project became the basis for my second book, Fathoming the Ocean. Um, but what I wanna do here for a moment is pause and tell you a little bit about my journey as a woman and as a parent, um, because I think that uh, one's private life is as important to pay attention to as one's professional life. So I followed a partner who had an academic job and I was unable to find an academic job in that same place. So I spent about seven years, well, exactly seven years, I know how long it was, doing a combination of consulting work and part-time teaching and part-time administration um, because I wanted to start a family. And so these actually are my real kids. They're not like fake pictures of fake kids. This is where you actually start seeing, seeing me. So this semi pause in my career seemed to me like the right decision at that time. And it still feels like the right decision to me today. Um, it means that my path through my career was, you know, a little different in, in pacing than other people's, but, and nobody's, following a standard cookie cutter path in a career these days anyway. Um, I was incredibly fortunate to get the opportunity as a sort of public history project to write the history of an intergovernmental marine science organization called ICES, the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea. And that became this book. And that probably had a lot to do with how I got my job at UConn, which I began in 2003. And this is a picture up here of me um, teaching a group of students at Mystic Seaport, um, which I picked even before I knew that Crystal was the other panelist. Um, that was one of the appeals for me about my job at UConn. So at UConn, I began 
the Maritime Studies major which is an interdisciplinary major designed to allow students to investigate the human relationship with the ocean, especially through, especially through the lenses of the humanities and the social sciences. Think history, literature, economics, geography, uh, anthropology, maritime archaeology, also sciences, but, but uh, especially with the humanities and social science focus. And this program provided me with the perfect platform for what I most wanted to do, which is to help people understand how people have been connected with the ocean and remain connected to the ocean, even inland people, even people in the past, um, and people in many, many different cultures having different relationships uh, with the sea. And I did this through teaching, but it was also the focus of my uh, research and my professional work as a historian. And this is me, actually me, sailing on the Mystic Whaler with a group of students um, two years ago or something like that. All right, so, um, oh, and I forgot to say a few years after I arrived at UConn, that is when my second book, my revised dissertation came out. Uh, and I said before that it was a history of ocean sciences, which it is, but it also makes a, a, a wider argument about the simultaneous scientific and cultural discovery of the deep sea in the mid 19th century through professional and popular science, through naval surveying, but also through the emerging submarine telegraph industry, uh, through the recreational embrace of Oding, uh, the ocean, including through yachting and beach going and swimming on the beach and aquarium keeping and things like that. And so with that book, I set out on kind of a mission, I guess I would say, uh, to convince others of the need to pay attention to ocean history. Um, my third book, as you saw, uh, came out just a few years ago, Vast Expanses, A History of the Oceans. And I will say my, probably one of my greatest professional satisfactions is that that book has also come out in Korean and Chinese, which is incredibly exciting. Uh, so I, I wrote this book at the same time I developed and taught a new course, which I also called History of Oceans. And the book and, and the course also, but the book argues that we need to address the terrestrial bias of history, to acknowledge that most histories focus on land, and instead we need to put the ocean in the center of some of our histories. Not all our histories, we can still do all the other kind of histories too, but 71% of the Earth's surface is ocean, 99% of the Earth's habitable living space is ocean, and gosh darn, we should write the history of the ocean. Um, so uh, it, the book further argues that we need to recognize the oceans historically, not just in traditional ways as a surface for transport, uh, surface for warfare, a source of fish and other resources, but we need to acknowledge the volumetric ocean, its depths as well as its surface, uh, and also features like upwelling systems, currents, seamounts, all these places are caught up in history. It argues that different cultures have different and unique relationships with the ocean. Uh, and that the Western relationship with the ocean is not the same as the relationships forged in Oceania, the Indian Ocean region, West Africa, and other places uh, around the world. So I spent the last decade or so giving public talks, professional talks, I'll talk to anyone about ocean history. Um, and uh, just to give you two examples, uh, this year I published a virtual exhibit called The Oceans in Three Paradoxes, um, which is uh, aimed at academic audiences and hopefully also some other wider audiences. And I'm also the co-editor of a new book series uh, trying to promote oceans, ocean history, and that is very much an academic thing. So this work that I've been doing is gaining traction uh, because in this day and age, awareness is growing of the role of oceans in our global climates and the outsized effects that climate change will have on oceans. I'm sure you all know more about that than me warming, sea level rise, acidification, storm intensification, uh, movement of species, ranges, and things like that. And I've long argued that it is important to understand that the human relationship with the ocean is a long story, um, but it, that it is also uh, a relationship that has intensified over time with industrialization and globalization. And climate change makes recognition of ocean histories more than academically important. Um, some of you may be familiar with the term ocean literacy, which is a framework that has been adopted by the United Nations to articulate the concepts people need 
to be in uh, to make informed and responsible decisions about uh, the ocean. The concept of ocean literacy was created by scientists and science educators, um, uh, and uh, but it it. It lacks enough attention, I think, to historical change and cultural difference. And that's one of the things that I hope that my work can contribute uh, in, in the kind of big wide world, because our present ocean challenges don't involve only science, they involve people. And so we need to bring the humanities uh, into uh, the process of understanding what's happened in the past and thinking about how to move forward. Uh, so that's just a bit about the journey that has brought me here to Yukon Avery Point. Um, and I super look forward to our uh, discussions and questions. Thanks. Awesome. That was great. Um, that's so interesting and in thinking about the connections of science and history and literature and all the different ways you can connect to the ocean. That's not hard science and seeing your path in that. Um, I know I have some questions. I know the girls do too, but we're going to go right into Crystal. And um, Crystal, if you're ready to go. I think you're muted, Crystal. Yes, here I go. Sorry. I'm just adding one more picture I just thought of that I wanted to share based on that Helen was saying. So, all right, let's see. Um, oops, hold on just a sec. I'm trying to figure out how to get the slideshow going. Screen share. Okay, can you see that hopefully? Yeah, that looks good. We can see your screen. Okay, slideshow from the beginning. All right, how's that? Okay. So, um, and you guys can hear me okay? All right, so thank you for asking me to do this and hopefully this will be, um, this will be, this will not be quite as interesting as Helen's. I think Helen has got such an amazing career and I've just enjoyed so much working with her over the years. And um, while you were just speaking, I just remember uh, uh, different things that apply here, uh, ways that times that I've worked with you that actually um, that come into play here. So um, so anyway, I just want to say that um, I kind of like Helen, I have a weird connection to, not a weird, but I grew up on a farm. I grew up on a farm in uh, rural Eastern North Carolina. So um, while I spent a lot of time in the summertime and fall going to the ocean and the beach and spend, spending time with my family there, um, I probably one of the first aha moments in my life where I realized I really want to do something that is connected to the ocean and to the sea and to the humanities. Um, is was when I was a kid. And I don't know if anybody on this uh, program has ever seen the show Reading Rainbow on PBS, but I was a big fan of Reading Rainbow. And there's a wonderful episode of Reading Rainbow where LeVar Burton, who is the host, who you see me with on the right, because believe it or not, I'm a nerd and went to a library conference and met him at the library conference where he talked about roots and Reading Rainbow and all the amazing things that he's done. Um, but so uh, when I was a kid, I saw this one episode of Reading Rainbow and the way that the show goes is, um, is really sweet. They always read a book together. Um, LeVar Burton or another person reads the book and they explore some of the concepts in the book and then they go out and they might do some things on different, do things in different locations um, that are related to that book. So um, this one episode, they read the book called Keep the Lights Burning Abbey. And I absolutely loved it. I had to get it. Um, I, I got it at the library. And um, it, it actually started an interest in for me in lighthouses and female lighthouse keepers and, um, and just more of a maritime connection that I had had before. And I'll also say that in that same episode, um, LeVar Burton goes to the um, to a model, a ship model maker's shop 
and they make a model in a bottle. And I was like, wow, that's so exciting. That is so cool. So I think it's pretty ironic that today I work in a place with easily about 120 ship models in bottles. Um, so anytime, if you were to ever, if you guys were ever to come on a tour of the collections at Missy Seaport with me, you will no doubt see all of the models in bottles um, because I feel like I have such a strong connection to it um, from this silly, weird little connection. But so anyway, um, I left the farm in North Carolina and I went to um, the University of North Carolina at Wilmington, uh, which is on the beach or, or uh, is near the beach. It's, uh, it's on the Cape Fear River in Wilmington, North Carolina, but I lived at the beach um, for a part of the time that I, was, um, that I was in college there. And they actually offered a few maritime history courses, which was really cool. So I took those. I don't think I did very well in them. Um, there was a lot of complicated reading, probably stuff that Helen, <laughs> Helen was just was, knows all about. Out. Um, but uh, but yeah, so that's kind of where I was able to really start connecting with the ocean even more um, was whenever I went to school there. <clears throat> and towards the end of my uh, my path at UNC Wilmington, I started to realize that um, I was going down a path where I I it kind of became apparent. I had a real interest in objects and stuff and material culture. And I had a professor at the University of North Carolina at Wilmington, um, Dr. Frank Ainsley, who was teaching um, historic preservation courses, um, kind of like, well, it, around the time it was kind of starting to become a thing. And um, he really encouraged me to, um, to look into the Savannah College of Art and Design in Savannah, Georgia, um, and their historic preservation program. So I, um, so I did that and I, I worked for him part-time also um, creating indexes for material culture journals, um, which is super boring, but also kind of fun. So I did that for, um, for a couple of years with Dr. Ainsley and uh, looked into SCAD, which is the, the name for the little acronym for Savannah College of Art and Design. And also um, College of Charleston was starting a historic preservation program at the time also. And uh, I got accepted to those programs and another, and I um, really had a tough time deciding between the two. Um, the College of Charleston program was a combination program with the Citadel. So you would take part of your classes there and part of your classes at College of Charleston. And this is going to sound really funny, but the way I made up my mind is I got I got stuck in the elevator at the College of Charleston, and I thought that was a bad omen. So I decided Savannah College of Art and Design it is. And so I went off to SCAD, and it was probably one of the most life-changing experiences for me. I really loved the faculty and connected with them, and it was a very small group of graduate students that got to know each other really well over the course of two years. And one of the things I loved about the program, which is why I've included these pictures here, is that um, everything in the program was hands-on. So there was, um, you know, there was a, a focus on working in the lab, working in the preservation lab, getting to understand materials. Um, so doing lots of hands-on things like that, but also, you know, nonprofit management courses, um, preservation law. There was just so many different um, options and ways to study and things to study. And every time that I could, I tried to create these maritime connections. So in preservation law, of course, my papers were about um, were about uh, about shipwrecks. So um, you know, everywhere I'm like trying to find little connections. These pictures are probably some of my favorite times. Um, I briefly thought, I bet I might be able to create a career in um, in cemetery preservation because that's really cemeteries is one of my uh, this is not really maritime related, but it's one of my big passions is cemetery preservation. And so I worked for several years, uh, started as an internship and then uh, turned into a job. Um, I worked as a cemetery conservator's assistant. And so, um, so here I am actually um, working on ledgers and headstones. And then the top picture is a, a strange picture with a maritime connection. This is at Old Fort Jackson, Jackson in Savannah, Georgia. Um, and I was part of the team, the preservation team that completely repointed um, the entire moat wall at Old Fort Jackson. So believe it or not, you had to get up at like 3 a.m., go out at the very low, low, low tide um, and stand on pallets while crabs and all kinds of things are falling out of the, of the, um, the bricks and scrape out the mortar and then put the new mortar in. 
And I'll also say that some of the stuff we did was really cool um, because of our connections with the school and having access to a preservation lab, we were able to do mortar analysis on the mortar used in all the bricks in these different restoration projects that we worked on. And we were able to use um, uh, sand dredged from the Savannah River to actually go into a lot of the mortar that we created. So it was really fun. Um, and I know a lot about historic masonry now. So who, who would have thought? But um, it hasn't gotten me very far other than when I was there. But, uh, but it's fun stuff nonetheless, and I thought worth mentioning. Um, I, I worked, so at the same time, I started also doing this job with the Coastal Heritage Society. And one of the places that they run is Old Fort Jackson. So I actually began on the preservation team um, doing a lot of hands-on historic preservation work to their buildings and structures. And uh, then I got approached about coming um, over to, um, to take on an office job and uh, they needed a programs coordinator. And so I started um, in the office there actually creating programs for these different sites. So the Coastal Heritage Society runs all of these different museums. They've expanded. So when I was there, it was only the Savannah History Museum, the Georgia State Railroad Museum, and Old Fort Jackson. And so um, I did everything from the creation of hands-on history summer camps to the revolutionary perspectives lecture series, talking about revolutionary war connections in Georgia. Um, I did a lot of grant writing, and, and that's really where I started grant writing, um, which has played a huge part um, throughout my career. It's been something that I feel like, especially if you're interested in nonprofit work, you're going to have to, at some point, write a grant or review grants, which I always um, would suggest if you're interested in that, but this is kind of where I started learning those skills. Then I applied um, for jobs all over the place. I really wanted to get out of the South. And because of that weird connection to keep the lights burning Abbey, I was like, I want to apply for jobs in New England. And uh, so I ended up at Mississippi Port starting in uh, January 2007. So I actually just celebrated my 15th year at Mississippi Port Museum, which is hard to believe. Um, but if you guys are familiar with Mystic Seaport Museum, we're a museum that strives to, um, to help people understand uh, connections to the American maritime experience. So um, not only do we have formal exhibit galleries, which is what you see right here, but we also have a 17 or a 19 acre campus, depending on who you ask here at the museum. And, uh, and it's quite um, an exciting campus. I would hope that if you haven't been, please know that I'm extending an invitation to you right now. And I would be so happy to, um, to meet with any of you guys and take you around here. But you can see um, that we have a really large campus, including a uh, working a preservation shipyard, which is really cool. And sometimes I get the itch to go do things in the preservation shipyard, and I always end up caulking, um, which is very similar to repointing bricks. And so if you don't know about caulking, it's actually the process of making ships watertight um, with, a, with a cotton strand called oakum. And it's very, very similar to repointing bricks. So that's kind of fun. Um, but we do have this preservation shipyard. We have um, about 500 historic vessels here at the museum, including kind of our star artifact, which is the Charles W. Morgan, which is the last wooden whaling ship in the world. Um, that's actually right here I'm pointing out. We also have a historic village. Um, and when I say historic village, most of the buildings were moved to the spot to create, um, to be able to tell a story to support um, some of the different vessels that were here at the museum. And then the north end of the campus is kind of known as our, um, that's where we have more formal exhibit galleries. So um, what I do here in the collections, so I should say I started out um, in collections working as collections management technician. So, so handling the stuff, that's a, that's a long way to say I, I would take care, I take care of the objects, of the artifacts, of the documents. That's really um, what my job is here. And, and I'm so thankful for that because it's back to my love of material culture. Um, so I started out in the collections. I did a long stint in education. And then most recently in the past two years, I've come back into working in the collections. But just so you know what I mean when I say collections, I wanna just go through some of the things really quickly. Um, so the, the, one of the big collections that we have that I mentioned is the, uh, the watercraft collection. So it's about 500 uh, ships, boats, and a lot, a lot of small boats, canoes, and all kinds of interesting watercraft. I'll talk a little bit more about those in a moment when I talk about some of the exhibits that we're working on. 
Um, but then we also have about 2000 models. So when I said earlier, when I was talking about the models and the bottles, not only do we have the models and the bottles, but we have um, so many incredible models that were either built for decorative purposes or actually uh, to use to actually build ships and boats. Um, so we also have a lot of half models, which aren't pictured um, in here. We have a lot of carvings and figureheads, so about 70 carvings and figureheads that were used in different ways on uh, ships. Um, so you see here, there are some gangway boards down at the bottom. There are uh, eagle carvings, and uh, we actually have a beautiful new exhibit on figureheads here at the museum. So I would encourage you to get out here and take a look at it whenever you get a chance. We have about 1,400 paintings in the collection, and uh, this unit, uh, the this particular um, unit that's open in this picture is uh, pictures of the Buttersworth collection. James Edward Buttersworth is one of the most famous uh, marine artists. And uh, a really cool experience I had is once Antiques Roadshow came here and filmed uh, in the vault right here at this aisle. And it, I thought it was so interesting because if you ever watch that show on PBS, it just seems as if those people rattle off all those amazing facts off the top of their head. But in fact, um, the woman rattled off all the stuff that I wrote and the librarian wrote for her to say. So it made me feel a lot better. Um, and it was such a fun experience to, to work with PBS and on um, the cast and the, um, and the host. So there have been some really fun things like that that have popped up in my time here at the museum. Other things that we have in the collection, we have hundreds of textiles. This is a really cool sea bag um, from around the War of 1812, and it's beautifully embroidered with all these different scenes that are so fun to interpret and to use with students and teachers and to use in exhibits. It's actually on exhibit right now. Um, and we also have a collection of marine engines. If I believe if the number is correct, I want to say about 500 marine engines also. Um, this has its own curator, its own person that takes care of it, which is really exciting. Uh, a special collections library, which Helen is there, very familiar with, over 1 million pieces of manuscript material and a rare book collection. Um, this is our VP for collections, one of the, the best people I know, Paul Opeco. I'm so lucky to have him as my boss and uh, a couple of uh, volunteer and one of our librarians here. And they're actually, if I believe, if I remember correctly, this is a book of maps and charts um, that Paul is having photographed. So that's actually a big part of what I do is photograph objects that have connections to the ocean. Uh, and I'll talk about the different ways in which they get used really briefly coming up. Um, we ha also have a lot of things that are that are basically the parts and remnants of marine mammals um, from a lot of stuff from uh, from whaling and uh, a lot of scrimshaw about 1400 pieces of scrimshaw total so um, you can see some of that here and this is really kind of my favorite stuff. Um, I'm kind of known around these parts as the person who loves all of the odd weird wacky wonderful things and um, I'm starting to get a reputation for that so I've got to start <laughs> branching out into something else but um, but while I've been here, uh, a big part of my career uh, here focused on, um, I moved over into the education department and managed a very large grant from the Institute for Museum and Library Services to um, work with teachers, students, and parents to figure out how all of this stuff that I've just shown you guys, how all these amazing objects that tell stories about the ocean and our relationship with the ocean, how can we make these things accessible to parents and teachers and students? And so I worked for a while on a project um, that ended up uh, in the creation of the Mystic Seaport for Educators website. And so I would encourage you to check it out if you get a chance. There are tons of resources and beautiful photographs and lectures and documents and all kinds of fun things that, that anyone can use. The website is open to everyone. It's really geared towards teachers, um, but it's a, it's a really cool website. It took a lot of work. It took um, years of research um, with a you know, consulting firm and with about 150 um, teachers and students uh, to actually get it right. So we really wanted to make sure we worked with the public to understand what people needed um, uh, to put it out there. So um, also it was the beginning of our virtual program. So believe it or not, way long ago, pre-COVID, this is like 2012, we started playing around with doing virtual programs. And this sounds so silly, but this picture, I, this, this moment was like the coolest thing to me because I was like, oh my God, we're really doing it. Who would have known like, you know, years later, we're doing it every day, all day long. Um, but it was really exciting at the time in the beginning of really what made us prepared for COVID, I think. 
um, later on, I started working in, um, after my stint in education, I came back over to collections and worked in intellectual property work, which is kind of fun, and even helping people just like Helen to access our images and objects uh, to use in publications, to use in other museums, to use in movies, to use on television. Uh, so really cool stuff. And, um, and now a lot of what I do is focused on learning about and sharing the stories of all of these amazing objects in our collection that um, are related to the ocean and to help people understand them through exhibits and through books and tours and all kinds of things. So of course, you see me here on the left holding my favorite object in the entire world, which is a whale eyeball. Um, and I, you know, I've, I'm not, I don't have time to go into the story here, but if you guys ever want to hear stories about whale eyeballs and other bizarre things like kidney stones or ambergris, which is whale vomit or excrement, um, you can definitely come talk to me about these things. Uh, turtle shell cradles, all of these things are things that I really love. And, um, you know, I love pulling out these interesting stories and sharing them with people. I've also had the opportunity through Mystic Seaport Museum to go to a lot of really amazing places um, to speak at the Australian National Maritime Museum, uh, to go study whale, uh, whaling in the Azores, which has was been a really amazing opportunity. And then lastly, I want to just close out with things that I'm working on now that I think are really relevant uh, here at the moment, uh, considering I'm speaking to Ness. But um, I'm working on several projects at, which are becoming exhibits here at the museum. One is learning more about invasive species here uh, in the river and locally. Um, and so I'm working with our photographer, Joe Michael, here at the museum to take photographs of different invasive species. And some of you guys might recognize these. This is right here on the nest dock. This is the light bulb tunicate or the light bulb sea squirt. And uh, we are creating these panels. Helen, are you involved in the panels that are on the river? You're not, okay, all right. There's a lot of different people, including a Yukon student that is, that's involved and she's amazing, um, Catherine Hines. So, um, so anyway, we're working on these panels to talk more about invasives in the rivers. Um, and locally, we're working with Dr. Jim Carlton over at Williams Mystic Program. This is one of his favorite little shrimps over here. And, um, and collecting things even at Nest, this is the, um, this is a really beautiful Sacoglossin, which is the vegetarian sea slug, not a nudibranch, which is the carnivore I've learned from Jim Carlton. But we're creating, we're taking pictures, we're finding connections with, um, uh, at the Harvard Museum of Comparative Zoology, there are these amazing glass models of marine invertebrates created by, um, by Blosh the Blaschkas, which were a father and son uh, duo that created these beautiful, and you can see some of them here, these beautiful glass models of jellyfish and nudibranchs and all kinds of other interesting marine invertebrates. So I'm working on an exhibit to connect um, marine invasives here locally to the Blaschka models and then also connect with our collection. So this is um, William Edward Edwin Safin, who I'm currently um, kind of have a weird obsession with, but he we have this beautiful journal of his here in the museum uh, when he was on board. Um, the, I'm sorry, the name is, is leaving my mind for a moment here. It starts with an S. But the um, he kept a journal of all these incredible sea creatures that he found while he was um, while he was sailing. And so we're trying to find connections with those. It'll be part of an exhibit coming up um, in 2023. And then I'm also working on an exhibit um, that my boss has put together, uh, Alexis Rockman, who is a very well-known artist. He's creating um, a series of paintings for us. The exhibit will be called Oceanus. And it features um, all kinds of, his painting is based on models in our collection. One big painting is at least, um, featuring Inuit kayaks and small fishing boats to contemporary mega freighters. And his goal is to show how these boats and ships help to show the history of human activity and relationship with the ocean, including their direct ties to the exploitation of resources in the world's waters. Um, so one of the other cool things about this is that he's doing a series of watercolors and some of those watercolors are based on the research of Jim Carlton over at the Williams Mystic Program. And so some really exciting stuff is coming up uh, with him. And then lastly, we're working on an exhibit that's opening up in just a couple of months called Story Boats, where we are pulling out some of these really amazing uh, boats in the collection that I mentioned earlier and showed pictures of and uh, telling the story. So we picked boats that have really incredible human interest stories. Vireo that you see here on the left belonged to, uh, to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. 
Um, you've got a Boston Whaler in the middle that's cut in half, which was very, uh, very popular advertisement in the 1960s. The Boston Whaler became known as the unsinkable uh, boat. And then on the far right is, uh, you're going to love this, Mary. Uh, uh, Helen, do you know whose boat that is on the far right? That is John Steinbeck's Boston Whaler which is going to be on exhibit. So anyway, I've gone over. I'm sorry, but um, all kinds of fun stuff to share. Hopefully I didn't talk too long. Happy to answer any questions. I can totally confirm that I have seen a whale eyeball on a tour with Crystal. You will. I don't let anybody leave without seeing it. It just wouldn't be fair. <laughs> Well, that was awesome, Crystal. Just seeing what both of you have accomplished um, is really amazing for, I know the girls, and just for me thinking about how, how much time and how much um, expertise that you've learned in your field is, is really incredible. Um, do we have any questions right now? Okay, okay Juliana has a question. <laughs> so you mentioned that um, you had like, over 500 like engines like do they still work by any chance or are they just like out of order so a lot of them do and every summer we have an engine expo and some of the engines are pulled out and uh, we have a really incredible team of volunteers at the museum so there are a lot of volunteers that specialize just in the engines and watercraft and they live to come in on Tuesdays and start some of those engines so um so yeah so every summer uh there at that expo we actually pull out a lot of those engines and uh, and show how they work great question Any other questions from our mavens in the chat? They can just drop them into the chat and we can read them out. Um, I know one that I was thinking of um, for both of you, for Crystal and Helen, um, if there were any obstacles that you faced um, through your career path being um, just in general or specifically being a woman um, in a career path, I know it can be a little bit tougher sometimes in the seafaring industry. I think it's seven to one women are outnumbered. So just wondering your personal stories um, there. Helen, feel free to go. If you want. you want me to go first? Okay. Uh, so I will say that in my PhD field, the history of science, when I started, there were probably more men than women, but um, it was, I was in a very supportive, um, the University of Pennsylvania where I went was very supportive. I had a close group of friends um, so I have had, uh, a good experience. It is more common among people who are, uh, going into university level teaching to have the, now to have the experience that I had, which, um, it's a, it's a very tight job market today. And many people spend many, many years as I did doing part-time teaching and doing other kinds of work and, and taking a long time to, to get, you know, a kind of um, academic teaching job in a university being a university professor. And um, a lot of people who get advanced degrees like I did are even not finding academic jobs anymore. So um, I was very lucky. Um, and, and I think one of the things I always try to encourage people to understand is how luck really does play a part in some of these things. I mean, if I had stayed, I was in Georgia, if I had stayed in Georgia, um, I probably wouldn't be a university teacher. I probably would be doing something else, um, uh, possibly public history, contract history, some kind of public uh, facing work more than the teaching that I do now, uh, because you know, that's kind of where I was headed. I did a lot of administration. I might've ended up doing like nonprofit administration or academic administration. So there's, you know, there's a certain amount of, it sounds, uh, you know, I felt like Crystal's story sounded so, you know, purposeful all the way along. And, and you know, I suspect mine did too, hearing it the way I told it, but, but it's very, it's, you know, there are these accidents and, and, and serendipities, these kind of happy accidents that, uh, that sort of land you maybe not exactly where you, I never thought I would end up in New England. I mean, I thought I was going to live in Georgia for the rest of my life. And then this job at UConn came open and, and, and I took it. Uh, and I had 
one other giant obstacle, which had to do with family issues. Um, and the, the, the one that I'll talk about is that uh, I, my oldest son uh, was sick for a year and that was very tough. Um, and my parents moved in with me to help me take care of him. And, uh, you know, I was just super lucky to have a supportive family and to have an employer at UConn that, you know, helped me figure out how I could keep doing my job while I had my parents helping me take care of my kid. Um, so, so yeah, there have been some difficult times, but uh, I'm, I'm mostly pretty lucky and mostly come to understand that I just need to go with the flow and not try to think ahead of, decide ahead of time where I want to go, but rather go where life takes me. Maybe that's a good way to say it. And I'll, I'll agree um, that there were definitely um, parts left out of my presentation that I probably should have mentioned, like how when I got the job at Mystic Seaport, it was because I'd applied for easily over 90 jobs all over the country and I got one call back <laughs> and it happened to be uh, in Connecticut. And so, and I happened to know a few people up here in the area. So it seemed like, all right, I guess this is where I'm going. Um, I'd actually really hoped to move to California and I uh, had my like eyes set on Catalina Island. Um, so that was actually like one of the other things. It was kind of this New England pull and then also California. But, um, but I would agree, I would say that, um, you know, there, there are so many different things on the pathway to where you end up that don't make sense at the time or seem really difficult at the time. And then you look back on it and realize, wow, I actually can now see how that's played a big part in, in how I got to this, this place. Um, I would also say that I feel like when I started working here at the museum 15 years ago, it was definitely a lot more males in uh, positions of management and vice presidents and curators. And I have seen this like amazing shift over the past um, five or six years specifically where more women are stepping into those roles, which is so exciting. Our new VP for curatorial affairs is a woman. Our new, uh, we have another new curator who is a woman, Akia. And there are just so many people stepping into these positions here. And it's really interesting and exciting to be a part of that shift. Um, I'll also say that, um, that Helen brought up the whole, the piece about family. And I also have two small children and it has, there have been times where it has been incredibly difficult to, to even show up to work. Today is one of those days, <laughs> you know, where, you know, just trying to get dressed and make it to a director's meeting on time and having a two-year-old hanging onto your leg and singing, I've been working on the railroad. You just don't think you're gonna make it into work. Um, and I, I'll say in particular, uh, I would say one of the most challenging parts of my, you know, time as a working woman was definitely during the beginnings of COVID. Um, I was home with a newborn and suddenly um, about, uh, you know, almost 200 of my coworkers were laid off. I had been in a department that was 30 and we went to three. And I was asked to do a lot of the work to, um, to carry on our mission uh, in the education department. And so I was, you know, nursing a small baby, going into a closet and doing Zooms for six and seven hours at a time. And um, it was a real, uh, but it was, it was a serious struggle for months there um, with a lack of sleep and, you know, trying to manage everything and keep the kids and, um, and, you know, having a husband working at Ness at the same time, dealing with some of the same issues, except he wasn't nursing anyone, but, um, but yeah, so I would, I would agree with a lot of what Helen said as far as like challenges or um, things, unexpected things along the path. <clears throat> well, that's really good wisdom, I think, um, just thinking about going with the flow, how things can change and moving, moving the way that life brings you, right? Just like the ocean staying in the flow of it um, and just hoping that you get to where, get to where you're meant to be along the way and stay in your passions. Um, another question that um, I was thinking of is, 
if you guys could share maybe one of your favorite memories um, of the ocean or maybe your first memory of the ocean. Um, I always think that's interesting to learn just like someone's first reaction to the ocean, if they remember it. Well, I sort of did in the sense of telling you about that 11 year old trip to the Delaware coast. I was actually born in North Carolina. So I certainly saw the ocean when I was one and two, but I don't remember that. So really, you know, I had this experience with Lake Erie. I had this experience on the Delaware coast. And, and I have to say, when I found out about the Sea Education Association program, I was just laser focused on that opportunity. And I was really thinking, as I said, about the tall ship, but um, it turned out that the six weeks I spent in Woods Hole living in this little village and being able to walk on by the beach every day was also amazing. Um, and I, you know, I guess I, what I remember most strongly though, is that sort of sense of being on this um, schooner uh, and, and being out of sight of land for two weeks. I just loved that every single day. I felt like life was so simple. You, you slept with everything you owned, so you didn't have any extra stuff. Um, this is before, way before cell phones. So, you know, there were no, there, you know, it was just paper, books, people, and, you know, learning what we were learning. And it was, it was so freeing. I felt like when I got back, um, my dorm room seemed crowded with stuff I didn't need anymore. That, I, so I guess, you know, that's, that's not so much the ocean itself as kind of a, a glimpse of maritime life, but. Yeah, I would say that some of my like first memories of the ocean are in North Carolina. Um, I used to go to the beach all the time with my family and uh, I have very vivid memories of taking walks early, early in the morning with my uncle who would drop money on the beach in front of me. And for a long time, I thought money was just dollar bills were on the beach. Um, but I would also say that part of that experience, I would spend a lot of time in Moorhead City and Atlantic Beach and uh, that's the home to a, a pretty big fishing tournament um, and seeing these crazy fish that you cannot wrap your mind around on the docks at some of these places and and now as an adult like understanding that even more um, and those fish and our relationship with the ocean and with what lives in it is um, you know looking back on that and those memories and seeing those fish you know hanging up on the docks wow it's like incredible to think about but those are some of my probably earliest memories of the ocean awesome well thank you for sharing those um i know we had a really fun time listening to your stories and your paths and kind of all of your passions that involve the ocean and everything um, around it, everything circulating that. Um, so thank you, Crystal and Helen. Um, I think we're gonna, I see Emily has popped on. We've got Emily and Anupa. Um, last call for any questions for Helen and Crystal from our Mavens. We're gonna do like 10 seconds of silence just to let any questions that are coming fully come to fruition. <laughs> Okay. Um, and Helen and Crystal, would it be okay if we shared your emails with the girls if they have any questions? Yes. Or... Okay, awesome. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, really exciting to have you. We're going to have Mary is going to introduce our next panelist. So I'm going to step out of the way. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. So I'm Mary Trichter and I'm working alongside um, Sarah here at Ness with the Marine Mavens program. I want to introduce our next uh, speakers for the second half. Uh, we have Emily Hazelwood, who is a marine conservation biologist and offshore energy consultant. She has a BA in environmental science from Connecticut College and an MAS degree in marine biodiversity and conservation from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Emily was recognized on Forbes 30 under 30 list in the energy sector for her work with Blue Latitudes to develop sustainable, creative, and cost-effective solutions 
for the environmental issues that surround the offshore energy industry. Emily has extensive experience as a project manager conducting marine environmental impact assessments and designing and implementing remotely operated vehicle ROVE surveys for governmental agencies and private sector clients worldwide. Much of her work is centered around the ecological, socioeconomic, regulatory, and policy issues surrounding the implementation of rates to reefs programs in the United States and internationally. Ms. Hazelwood previously worked on the BP-252 oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. This is where she witnessed firsthand the destruction and devastation wrought by an oil spill. However, it, also, it is also where she learned of a unique silver lining despite the realities of offshore oil and gas development, the Rigs to Reef program. I'm also going to introduce Amber and Anupa. Amber is a marine environmental scientist and oil and gas consultant. She has a BA in marine science from UC Berkeley and an MAS in marine biodiversity and conservation from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. In 2018, Amber was recognized on Forbes 30 under 30 list in the energy sector for her work with Blue Latitude to develop sustainable, creative, and cost-effective solutions for the environmental issues that surround the offshore energy industry. Amber also has a strong background in technology and public outreach. A former ocean curator at Google, she engineered and launched intelligent layers in Google Earth and Google Maps that distill and relate complex concepts in ocean science for a variety of audiences. Today, she uses those skills in the oil and gas industry to map fishing activity in proximity to offshore structures and inform decommissioning decisions in relation to commercial fisheries. Mrs. Sparks specializes in ecological impact assessments, marine biological monitoring, and habitat restoration through the lens of the Rigs to the Reef program. Her work is primarily centered around the ecological, economic, and social issues surrounding the implementation of a Rigs to Reefs decommissioning option in California and internationally. And we also welcome Anupa Asokin an ocean advocate and avid water woman who works at the intersection of marine science, policy, and communication. She's worked at the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, led the Ocean Initiative and Government Affairs at X Prize Foundation, and is currently engaged in 30 by 30 efforts for the state of California and is Director of Ocean Impact at Bureau. Anupa serves at the National Board of Directors for Surf Rider Foundation and helps lead their justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion work. She is a graduate of UCLA and the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography and College of Business. Anupa spends her free time snorkeling, fishing, surfing, and paddling around the Southern California coast. Welcome, panelists. Thanks for having us. So begin with Emily and um, Amber, I believe you both are speaking together. Yes. Great. Welcome. Yes, great. Well, thank you for having us. It's a privilege to be here today. And if it's all right with you, we can just get started with our presentation. Can you see my screen okay? Yes. Okay, great. Well, I'll get started a little bit with my background. So I'm originally from the New England area. I grew up in New Hampshire before attending undergraduate at Connecticut College in New London, Connecticut. It was there that I got my degree in environmental studies. And it's also where I had my first internship at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. While I was there, we were looking at zebrafish eggs and the reason we were looking at zebrafish eggs is because the baby zebrafish actually develop so quickly that scientists can use them to understand how people develop bones and under, actually in particular understand diseases like osteoporosis. Once I graduated from Connecticut College, my first job was actually working as a field technician on the BP oil spill back in 2011. During that time, I was working on collecting water samples and sediment samples and biota samples, which means marine fish or shrimp or clams so that we could better understand the full impact of the spill and how far it had spread within the Gulf of Mexico basin. 
This was a really great experience for me because it taught me a lot about working as a scientist in the field and exposed me to lots of new sampling techniques. And it's also what introduced me to the Rigs to Reach program, where in the Gulf of Mexico, they've converted more than 500 offshore oil platforms into permanent artificial reefs. I then continued to work as a consultant um, up until 2013 when I moved to California to pursue my master's degree at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And a little bit about my background. I'm a California native and pursued my degree at UC Berkeley in marine science. I had always been so curious and passionate about the marine environment and about the ocean. It was one of my favorite places to go and explore. So I was really excited to be able to pursue uh, my degree there in the marine scientists in the marine sciences at college. I also did an internship with the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. And here we were researching the biology of small barnacles, barnacles that lived in symbiosis with coral reefs. And so they were nestling into those coral reefs and providing food for the corals while at the same time the corals were providing the barnacles a habitat and protection from predators. So that was a really cool experience and exposed me to some of that traditional lab-based science that many marine scientists do. But when I graduated, I realized I wanted to have a bigger impact. So I started working with Google in partnership with the Sylvia Earle Alliance to map our ocean's floor and take these really important ideas in marine science and communicate them to the general public through some of Google's tools in Google Earth and Google Maps. One of the things that we were able to launch was this, um, this underwater street view. So you see this little picture here where you could virtually dive along a coral reef and see the marine life all around you. I also worked with the Anthropocene Institute to develop technology for further mapping and protecting our marine protected areas through surveillance and technology development. But all of this led Emily and I, although we have two very different backgrounds from different sides of the US, brought us together at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, where we both pursued our master's degree in marine biodiversity and conservation. We were in the same graduate school class, and so it was a really great way for us to meet and then discover that we both had a really significant interest in how offshore oil and gas platforms function as reef habitat. In California, we are currently working on looking at these platforms as habitats. Have any of you guys ever seen an oil platform before? Are you familiar with that at all? Raise your hand if you have. Yeah, a couple of us. Well, if you haven't, this is what they look like on the left-hand side from your beach chair from the side of the road. They look just look like massive industrial structures, but Below the, below the surface, there's so much more. And in California, these platforms are covered in life, like you see on the right-hand side. There's scallops and enemies, mussels and schools that swim around these platforms. And these structures are massive. Some of them are the size of the Empire State Building. So you can imagine from the seafloor up to the top, that's a lot of infrastructure for this marine life to grow on. So Emily and I have been researching how to repurpose these structures, not as oil and gas drilling facilities, but rather as permanent artificial reefs. So as scientists and as marine scientists, we're fortunate to be able to ask these questions about how valuable are these structures as reefs and what does that really mean for the local environment and the local economy, as well as how is that going to impact other ocean users like fishermen or divers that may be out here and utilizing these resources. But there's only um, so much that we can do as divers on these platforms. And we really have to think about what other tools we have to explore oceans when we can't go diving. 
So one example of a tool that we use all the time in our work is a remotely operated vehicle. I don't know if any of you have ever seen aerial drones, like what people fly on land to take pictures and videos from the sky. Well, these operate very similarly, except we operate them underwater. And the reason we use these tools is because as scuba divers, we're limited to our recreational limits, meaning as traditional divers, we really can't go that much deeper than 100 feet if we want to be safe. So in order for us to collect data on marine life on platforms that may go down well over 2,000 feet, we need to use these remotely operated vehicles to start to record what we see. There's also a lot of, of uh, unique tools that these ROVs are equipped with. They come with high definition cameras so we can record everything that we see, lights because as you know, light starts to diminish in the ocean, especially when you get below 80 feet, things start to get really dark. We also have lasers on these ROVs and these lasers create small stripes in the water column that help us to measure how big marine life is. And finally, a lot of these ROVs come equipped with arms, which help us to collect samples of anything that we're looking at down below the water. What we specialize in working with is the Deep Trekker ROV. Now our nonprofit foundation has one of these ROVs and the reason that we really like it is that it's small and portable. It's only about the size of maybe a soccer ball or a basketball, but it's very powerful and we can use it to go around and make observations on pier pilings, on natural and artificial reefs and collect valuable data that we wouldn't otherwise be able to collect offshore of California. As you can see, it's equipped with the same things as those larger commercial ROVs. It's got a camera and lights and a, a grabber arm. And sometimes we even add an additional GoPro on top to collect more footage. So this is an example of what it looks like through the lens of the ROV. This particular video grab or this screen grab is from looking at a pier piling. And as you can see, it can look a little bit um, interesting. Maybe we lose a little bit of color or any something like that, but that's just because as we, you know, we're in a sedimented environment, sometimes the, that visual can be a little bit um, less clear. So that's why we add on the GoPro or some other lights, things like that, which help us get a bit better picture of what we're looking at. In this video here, you'll see that we decided to paddle out on kayaks and launch the ROV on the water. Operating the ROV is a two person job. We have one person that drives the ROV while the other per person makes sure that the yellow tether doesn't get tangled. The area where we explored with the ROV is called a marine protected area. That means that no one can fish or collect any animals or any seaweed. This allows marine life to thrive without the, the pressure of fishing. On this particular day, we saw all different kinds of fish, including that bright orange one that's called the Garibaldi, that's California state fish. And it can be found living on um, all over artificial and natural reefs in Southern California. After spending time driving the ROV along the sandy and rocky bottom, we hauled the robot back into our kayaks and, and paddled back to shore. But let's take a dive a little bit deeper than what we can go, how deep we can go with that little remotely operated vehicle. As we start to dive deeper into the water column, we'll start to see large schools of, in this example, we're diving deeper in the Gulf of Mexico, and we'll start to see larger examples of Creole fish, which you can see swimming in the background here. Fish swim, fish swim in schools for a lot of reasons. Um, one of the reasons is for protection from predators. There's always safety in numbers. It also makes swimming easier. It reduces friction in the water column so fish can start to save their energy. A lot of times fish will also hunt in school. It's a great way to go after their own prey. And sometimes it's just very social. Some fish like to spawn in large groups and this helps to ensure that their eggs will become fertilized and protected from predators. As we go even deeper into the water column, you'll start to note that it's getting a little bit darker. As we go deeper into the ocean, we start, ooh, the slide freeze. 
Yeah, let me get it. There we go. Thank you. We gotta go to the next slide. Oh, there we go. As we go deeper into the ocean, you'll start to see that light is disappearing. And in this video, you can see those laser stripes that I share that we work with. When we get a fish lined up just between those laser stripes, it helps to us to take measurements on the age of the fish. Um, but as you can see, we're starting to see a lot more cryptic species. Cryptic meaning smaller species like blennies and gobies. Those are those smaller fish that you see darting up the right hand side next to the right laser stripe. Not only can we observe fish using ROVs, we can also observe corals. And sometimes that involves taking samples of the corals using that um, grabber arm. Corals are actually animals that live in colonies and they're important for building reefs. They provide shelter for other organisms like fish and they actually are super important to help protect our coastlines. Most corals have a close relationship called symbiosis with another organism named zooxanthellae. And the zooxanthellae use the waste from the coral for photosynthesis, whereas the corals benefit by obtaining the oxygen and nutrients produced by zooxanthellae. You can say they're just like two peas in a pod. Unfortunately, many of our corals are at risk from a process called coral bleaching. So as you can see, the coral on the left-hand side is very healthy and on the right, it has been bleached. Bleach means that it no longer has that zooxanthellae that is providing that symbiotic relationship. And without the zooxanthellae, the corals cannot survive. Coral bleaching can be caused by a number of factors that stem from human activities like climate change. And these include increasing water temperatures, pollution, and other changes to the environment. As marine scientists, we study what is going on with the coral reef ecosystems and do our best to protect these some very sensitive um, ecosystems for the future. But what do we do with the data that we're collecting from the remotely, our, remotely operated vehicle? Well, like I shared, it's important to use this, the footage collected by the ROV because unlike a diver who's making notations as they're swimming along the ocean bottom, the ROV is recording video, which helps us collect a video log of every single species that we're seeing. We can also use the data to help identify things like invasive species. In the top right image is an example of orange cup coral, which is an invasive species that we find throughout the Gulf of Mexico. We can also make identifications on species like this lionfish, another invasive species that spread here mostly through people dumping out aquariums, but they are originally native in Indonesia. So they've really traveled a long way, but we see them a lot of times in the Gulf of Mexico and in Florida. Other types of data that we can use is using those laser stripes. So these are great examples of the laser stripes being centered on some of the fish species that we've observed. And what we'll use for these laser stripes is to determine not just fish size, but as these fish start to get bigger, we can understand if they've become sexually mature, if they're going to start breeding on their own. Smaller fish, we know based on their size, if they will be breeding or not anytime soon, which helps us create important data on production value of, these, of the observations that we're collecting. The ROVs also can transverse around a structure or reef to record marine life. Therefore, we can learn more about at what depths fish like to hang out at or in the range which certain corals like to observe. So this helps us understand at what depths different ecosystems are flourishing. We can go even deeper down to the super deep sea, down at 7,000 feet, where we see the Dumbo octopus. Um, this was a video taken from an ROV that was going along a pipeline on the sea floor and it captured this incredible footage of one of the deepest octopuses. We can also see the whiplash squid that here in this video has captured a cusk eel in its tentacles. 
This is down at 8,000 feet water depth. And it looks like the whiplash squid is capturing this eel for a dinner, but luckily it gets away right at the last minute. And we see it swim back down into the sand. And lastly, we take a look down at 7,000 feet and we see this incredible octopus moving slowly along the ocean floor. These octopus use their tentacles to look for food and determine where they are moving in the ocean bottom. But we don't just work in the Gulf of Mexico and in uh, California. We've also started to work in New England. Now, the reason being is that in New England, while we don't have the development of offshore oil and gas platforms, what we do have is the development of offshore wind farms. We're starting to see wind farms pop up in areas like Block Island, we'll also be coming to Rhode Island, and really up, up and down most of the East Coast, we're going to start to see these structures. Now, if you look at a wind farm like the one in this picture, you'll note that it actually looks a little bit like an offshore oil and gas platform, except that the energy that it produces is much, much cleaner. So what we're hoping to do is translate some of the things that we've learned about offshore oil and gas platforms and the marine life that grows there to better understand how the development of offshore wind farms will impact or benefit marine life. Brian Scarry, who's a photographer for National Geographic had a good understanding of this and started to take photos of the marine life found on offshore oil platforms, such as this jellyfish seen underneath one of Block Island's wind farms. Each day looks a little different from the next for a marine scientist, which means you're never going to be bored. There's many different components of the work that we do, and it can include teaching, like talking to others, such as through um, lectures such as this, where we get to share our love for the ocean with others. Another is field work. Being a marine scientist sometimes means you actually get in the water up close and personal with the marine life. This would involve collecting data on fish, corals, waves, currents. And there's also research and report writing. Another part of being a marine, marine scientist is being able to conduct that research that, help us, that helps us learn new things about our oceans. But there's other ways that you can help protect our oceans from home. And the most important way to do this is by reducing, reusing, recycling, and sharing. When you reduce, that means to use less plastic in your life. Make choices like not using a straw or bringing a reusable bag to the grocery store. If you do need to use plastic, make sure to reuse it. If you have a plastic water bottle that you bought at the grocery store, keep refilling it. Or if you got a plastic bag from a store, keep using that for future grocery trips. You also wanna make sure that anytime that you're using a plastic product, that you're recycling it into an appropriate recycling bin. Most importantly, you wanna rethink, make smarter choices, bring things like a stainless steel water bottle to school or to work with you rather than purchasing a plastic one. They also, if you love to use straws, they make, they make metal straws now so that you can, or biodegradable versions as well, so that you can make choices that are smarter than plastic ones. And finally, share your love for the ocean with others because with knowing comes caring and with caring, there can be hope for the future of our oceans. So as you finish your time in, in school and continue to work hard and reach out, we want you to continue to do well in school and reach out to teachers and family members if you're needing help in a class. You can look into research, internships, and volunteer opportunities, remote or in-person. These are incredible ways to gain skills and experience and try out various work experiences. You can also seek out professionals in the field that you're interested in and reach out to them. Learn about the steps they took to get where they are today. And you can also get SCUBA certified, which will help you explore our oceans and really take on your own type of research in the ocean. And seek out higher education at a university or community college where you can you know, really grow your academic pursuits. And lastly, 
share your love for the ocean with family and friends. This is always a great way to align with people who are, you know, interested in the same sort of things that you are. So we'll end with any questions or if we need to move on to another panel, I'm happy to stop sharing my screen. Well, thanks so much, Amber and Emily. Um, that was amazing. And um, we're actually going to move right over to Anupa because we have on our schedule with a Q&A after um, Anupa shares. So welcome, Anupa. Hey there. Thanks for having me. And thanks for talking about your work, Emily and Amber. That was really fascinating. OK, let me see if I can do this correctly. Can you see my slide? Yes. Yep. Great. Um, so I get to do less fun work in the ocean these days, though I try and spend my free time there as much as possible. Um, I help translate a lot of the things that scientists in the field are learning and bring that to policymakers so that we can, for example, like when we get data on all of this, the plastic that we find on the beach during beach cleanups, we can take that to policymakers to help them make better decisions and set policies around banning, you know, certain materials and kind of stopping the flow of plastic into the ocean in the first place. Um, so I'll start at the beginning. Um, I actually, I grew up in Florida, even though I'm in California now. Um, and my first connection to the ocean was through fishing. My dad loved to fish and I pretty much spent every weekend on the Gulf of Mexico fishing with my dad growing up. Um, that's still something that I do and I've held on to and I've kind of learned a new environment and learned how to fish out here in California. And it's something that I still really enjoy. Um, from there, and actually I was just thinking about this when I was a high school senior, I remember my biology teacher, um, I moved across the country to come to film school in California at UCLA. And when I was telling one of my teachers about it, she was like, gosh, when I was finishing high school, my only options were to become a teacher, a nurse or stay at home mom. Um, and it, she was just like really excited about like the new opportunities and potential that was out there. And even when I decided to come across the country to go to film school, I don't think I even realized all of the career opportunities that there are, particularly in ocean science, which I ended up doing um, later on because I took an oceanography class my first semester just to kind of get my science credit out of the way so I could focus on film school. Um, and it sort of changed everything for me. Outside of school, um, I took an internship at this fun little aquarium. It's just a little thing underneath the Santa Monica Pier. Um, and I helped feed and take care of the animals that we had. And that kind of transitioned into a weekend job running another pier-based aquarium out here in Southern California um, on the Manhattan Beach Pier. Um, so that was kind of then where I thought I could go, I didn't realize like, hey, there's a whole world of jobs in aquariums around the world, which was super fun. And what I ended up doing from college is I moved out to this amazing place called Catalina Island. And I actually taught marine science there for three years. And we had a little aquarium facility and kids from fourth grade to 12th grade all across the state of California and even inland, you know, from as far as like Nevada, Arizona, they'd get to come out to the island for a field trip. And it was like hands-on marine science. I took them snorkeling. Um, we had a small aquarium, as I mentioned. So we would teach labs in those aquarium spaces. We'd go hiking and learn a little bit about island geology and how that impacts the marine life that we have. We'd go kayaking and do all of these fun kind of hands-on learning experiences. Um, it was all truly magical and wonderful, but just not to oversell it. There are really hard parts about that. Um, we would get terrible weather and have to like bail out boats in the middle of the night. This is a picture of like our aquarium system broke and I was digging a hole at like 10 o'clock at night in the beach to repair a pipe. Um, in bad weather, like we had a float at the end of our pier, we'd have to like all jump out there and move it away so that it didn't break as it hit against the pier and stuff like that. So really learn to work well with your, your teammates and coworkers. You're stuck on an island with the same people 24 hours a day for like months at a time. Um, so it really teaches you how to, how to work with people and live with them and just be stuck with them. Um, so you learn patience and you learn how to be a team player. 
Um, as hard as it was to leave the island, it was time. It's time to move on and re return to civilization. And then I actually moved just up the road from all of you. Some of you might even live in Rhode Island. I went to the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography. I didn't fully know what I wanted to do. I know I wanted to do something ocean related. I wanted to learn more and go back to school. And URI had this great program where I could do a master's in oceanography and get a business degree, um, which really I just like put myself through torture because I got two degrees in like two years and it was just a lot of work and a lot of learning but I did learn a lot and I really enjoyed it and having been in warm climates my whole life I got to experience what a winter was like um, snow on a beach was just like mind-boggling to me and it was fun and amazing but I knew I couldn't handle winter um, I shouldn't tell you that it's like 73 degrees here right now as you're probably freezing up there in New England sorry a little plug for California um, so from Rhode Island, and actually when I graduated, I think I finished grad school at a time where there were just no jobs. No one was really hiring. I was having a hard time finding something. I think I, I had a little tally sheet of all the jobs I applied to and no one even got back to me and it was kind of discouraging. Um, but this opportunity popped up to go back into outdoor education and teaching for a little bit um, down in the Florida Keys. And that was super fun because I got to do that in my home environment because I grew up in Florida. So learning a little bit more about the ecosystems there and the different things that we have just sort of in the backyard that I, I grew up with and never took the time to experience underwater like I did when I was living out on Catalina. So that was really fun. Um, we went out to coral reefs, we snorkeled in, in mangrove um, habitats, we got to look at seagrass habitats and learn about the animals that live there and how all of those things are connected, as well as in the Everglades and how that fresh water flowing through the state through that swampy area impacts all of those ecosystems offshore. So that was really fun. But then I got a grown up job, I guess we would say. Um, I moved the farthest inland that I've ever been. I went to the Was Washington DC and I worked for this organization called the American Meteorological Society. Um, so apart from weather, they also had this education program um, that focused on oceanography. So I helped them develop out that program. And the hardest thing was going from living in the Keys, obviously, you know, I'm in the ocean and coral reefs all day, every day to this was my office view and had an office neighbor and one of the other um, organizations had this creepy like owl eye thing staring at me all day, every day. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, I did it and it kind of put me in the seat of like where all of the policy was happening, right? Like Washington DC is our capital, whether I wanted to or not and whether I was working on it on a daily basis or not. I got a foot in the door of government and how the government works and how science can impact a lot of the decisions being made for us. So outside of um, work, I jumped into um, this organization called the Surfrider Foundation. I volunteered with them. I mostly joined just as a way to meet other ocean people. I wanted some ocean friends to get out to the beach with every now and then and kind of keep that connection. Um, and I participated in a lot of local campaigns. And so I further kind of got into the advocacy and policy world in that way. We helped pass our local chapter there in DC. We passed a styrofoam ban um, for DC and for some of the surrounding counties in Maryland. Um, we partnered with all the surf rider chapters along the East Coast um, to push for an offshore drilling moratorium um, in the Atlantic, in the mid-Atlantic region. Um, and we had this fun campaign to do that where we had this surfboard that got passed from chapter to chapter from Florida all the way to New Jersey and local businesses signed it. And we got to bring that all around Capitol Hill and meet with um, congressmen and senators and things like that, which was a lot of fun. And it was great that it ended in kind of a campaign victory for us. Um, from AMS, I got this amazing opportunity still in DC, but to work for NOAA. So I went in the government world um, and I worked at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. If you're not familiar with NOAA, 
should be. It's cooler than NASA because it's like NASA, but for our own planet. So if you've ever used a weather app, um, even if it's from the weather channel or from your iPhone or whatever, all of that data is actually coming from NOAA originally. It's just repackaged into something that looks a little more interesting and colorful um, than what NOAA is allowed to give you. And my job here was really fun because I worked in communications. So a little bit of that was like speech writing for the head of NOAA. Um, but a lot of what I did was translating all of the science that was coming out of NOAA, all of the new things that we were learning about our own planet and translating that into something that legislators can understand and that the public can understand and working with scientists and coaching them on how to better frame their messaging and better talk about their science so that you know people besides just their colleagues who understand their lingo can understand what they're doing and understand the importance of the science that they're doing. Um, I really, really loved my job at NOAA. It was a lot of fun. I got to work with some really smart, amazing people. Um, I got to learn a lot more about how the government worked from the inside, which was great but I just was over being landlocked. I'm an ocean girl. I missed having that like easy access to the ocean. So I decided it was time for something new. And I ended up, I got a really cool opportunity to work with this organization called the X Prize Foundation. And at the time they were actually, so basically X Prize hosts these huge prize competitions. They're global to help solve some of the world's biggest problems. And the challenge that they were running at the time when I joined was to map the seafloor a lot faster. So if you think about it, basically the technology that we had to do that, you have to go out on a boat, there's a ton of people on it, you're running these surveys, and it really limits the amount of time you can spend out on the water. It's fuel intensive, all of those things. Um, so this competition basically is asking people to come up with some kind of robot that can go out from shore all on its own and map the seafloor to a high resolution. So we actually have a map that we can use um, and bring back that data and you know, draw a map. And we, I got to watch these folks come up with these really cool new pieces of technology uh, to do that. And it sounds really glamorous. Um, I spent a lot of time in a warehouse in Greece somewhere doing odd jobs. Here I am like splicing lines and tying ropes and things like that. And so we had an emergency plan if one of these um, robots got lost in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. And something else that I noticed though at the time um, when I was at X Prize um, was there was a lot of interest in prize competitions from legislators, congressmen, um, and people in Washington, D.C. and these government agencies that wanted to support this new like cutting edge science that could support the work that they're doing and our understanding of the planet. So I got back into the policy world through my job at XPRIZE and created a government affairs program for the organization, which was really cool, and started designing out a new competition as well to actually restore coral reefs. Um, we heard a little bit, I think, from Amber about how corals are bleaching around the world and dying. So this competition would actually make that whole process of getting new corals back out where they're supposed to be a lot faster, rather than having to have a diver go in and very slowly, meticulously hammer on some railroad spikes and attach baby corals back to the ocean. How can we do that a lot faster and maybe with some sort of robot or new technology? Um, really enjoyed my time at X Prize. Um, very honestly, the pandemic happened and there were funding cuts in different places. And I was sort of a victim of that. And unfortunately, I didn't get to see the coral competition through, but I think they're hoping to still get that going at some point. Um, and I, oh, this is a total aside. I still work with the Surfrider Foundation. I'm actually on their national board of directors. So I get to help set policy for the organization as a whole, which is really fun. And I do some volunteering with the local chapter. They have an awesome program teaching kids from underserved communities further inland who live in LA, live in this you know beachside uh, city, but have never actually been to the ocean. So we teach them how to surf and enjoy the ocean in a, a safe and fun way. Um, but from X Prize, I kind of jumped back into the policy world a little bit. Um, 
the World Surf League was engaging in this big global campaign. You may or may not have heard about it. It's a big policy push right now. It's called 30 by 30. And essentially there was a science paper that came out um, a few years or several years ago now saying that we need to protect half of our planet. We're losing species like a thousand times faster than we ever have in history. We're gonna lose about a million species within our lifetime. So the idea is we can make a deal with nature if we can protect half of our planet, that's land and ocean, um, hopefully by 2050, we can start to slow those extinction rates and give animals a better chance of adapting to the changes in our climate as climate change is happening and we work on solutions to that as well. So the interim goal to get to 50 by 50 is actually 30 by 30. How can we protect 30% of our planet in the next decade um, as a stepping stone to really avoiding that extinction? Um, on the ocean side, a big piece of the pushback in creating marine protected areas, which Amber and Emily also kind of talked about a little bit, um, is from the fishing community. They want to be able to fish wherever they want. Um, and I had this really unique perspective because I grew up fishing. It's something that I've always done, um, but I don't look like a lot of the fishermen that you see speaking out against marine protected areas. And so I got really fired up one day when uh, the, the state bill here in California to do 30 by 30 to actually protect 30% of land and water failed because of the fishing industry's pushback. And I wrote this op-ed just like really angrily one night and I submitted it and it got published. And all of a sudden there was a lot of attention around my voice and this other side of the fishing community and fishing industry. And it, was really speaking to a lot of people who fish offshore or fish from shore or fish off of a pier, just trying to feed their families at night. Creating these marine protected areas is actually super helpful to them, but they've never been given the opportunity to weigh in on these conversations. Um, and so this new perspective has gotten a lot of attention, both at the state level and at the federal level and globally, which I'm really excited about. And if you have any more questions about 30 by 30, I'm happy to answer that. Um, another organization that I'm supporting and thing that I'm working on is this really cool company called Boreo. And what they do is they work with fishing communities right now, mostly in South America and um, in Mexico. And they, rather than going and trying to like clean up all of this trash out of the ocean, they work directly with the fishing communities and create a solution where they'll buy back their old nets rather than them dumping them when they're done with them in the ocean. They buy back their nets. And for the smaller, um, you know, low income fishermen, they get that money. But for the big commercial fisheries, the money for those nets actually goes into a fund to support a local community project. Um, so that can be anything from mangrove restoration, uh, coral reef restoration, putting solar panels on, on local schools so they don't have to release more carbon emissions and things like that. And what they do with the nets is they've actually figured out a way to make nylon fabric out of it. And pretty soon all of Patagonia's jackets and shorts and things like that are going to be made out of this fully recycled um, fishing net material, which is pretty cool. Um, I just said a lot in I think 15 minutes, oh, more than 15 minutes. So I'll stop talking, but if you have questions, I'm happy to answer that. Thank you so much. That yeah. is really amazing, Anupa. So thank you. And Emily and Amber, truly inspirational. The three of you together can just conquer this world. <laughs> feel confident and you already are doing it so much in your industries. Um, but yeah, we'd like to open it up to any questions from the group or any of the attendees if you want to add in a question in the chat box or from Julia, Juliana or Ellie here or Sarah or myself, anybody? Okay, well, yes. I'll and one, um, you sort of alluded to it, Anupa, just sort of the, you know, adversity that you faced and sort of the stereotyping with fishermen and fisherwomen. And this was a question that Sarah asked the other panelists um, earlier. And so I 
open it up to the three of you of, you know, what adversity have you faced um, in your field as uh, females um, in the sort of a male dominated industry, um, certainly, uh, you know, decades ago, but also very much prevalent today in sort of the, you know, equality gap when it comes to gender in the field, but specifically if you face any adversity uh, progressing through your, um, your fields as women. Oof, that's a tough question. I mean, I think a lot of the struggles are mostly in trying to be heard and trying to get, you know, kind of an equal, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Just like an equal, uh, like being heard in the same way that um, if a man may had the same idea in a meeting, right? Like it would be a great idea, whereas it takes a little convincing <laughs> to get some of the things that you want to push forward, pushed forward. Um, and very candidly, like I'm going to give you the honest perspective here. I've had some like rough work situations and I think, and maybe Emily and Amber can relate as well. Like I, I came up in a generation where I think the women before us had to fight a lot harder to get into leadership positions and positions of influence. And I think often they want to like they see competition among the next generation of women. And I finally think that that's changing a little. So I've had some tough work situations that have actually just not been women being supportive of, of the younger generation. But I think as we have faced that and understood the increased challenges that that has made, um, I'm hoping that like my colleagues and my generation will be a lot more supportive of those coming up and doing things like this makes me happy because I want to be able to support you, like keep my email address or find me on Twitter or Instagram or whatever. And if you get to the point where you're applying for jobs and need advice, like I'm always more than happy to be able to do that. I didn't yeah. mean to make that sound depressing, but um, <laughs> it's just like part of how things go as you're figuring out the job world. I think I, I agree with a lot of what Anupa said. Um, and I think, you know, especially a lot of Amber and I's work, while there is a lot of women and there's a growing amount of women in the sciences, there's hardly any women that work in energy and in offshore energy. And a lot of times when Amber and I attend conferences or we're speaking on a panel, we're the only women in the room, we're the only women at the panel table. And sometimes that can be intimidating and sometimes that can feel like people aren't taking you seriously, that, you know, they're only looking to their male colleagues. But sometimes it also, there's a lot of power in that. Um, when you're the only female in the room, people, I think, pay attention to you because they're curious what you have to say and curious what you're doing there. And so sometimes I do think there can be a lot of strength and power that you can draw from being the only female in the room or the only person of, with a different background than everybody in the room. You know, I think there's always challenges associated with that. You need to rise up to the challenges, but and certainly we felt very, very often that um, it can be a struggle where people don't take us as seriously um, or just think, you know, they're just two little girls trying to save oil platforms. But I also think there can be a lot of power in having a female voice in those rooms and people are interested in what you have to say. Yeah, I mean, I had a totally just a different perspective from the fishing industry and fishing like lobby groups and that's what actually got me a lot of attention around the work that I've been doing for so long. So yeah, that's a great point, Emily. Actually, Anupa, um, Amber noticed, are you a member of the Explorers Club? I'm not a member. I guess I need to fill out paperwork because they asked me to, <laughs> but um, I gave a talk there uh, for the coral restoration effort that I was doing through XPRIZE. Oh, Amber and I are both members. So if, oh, you are awesome. interested, if you're are interested, All right. if I need them, a new sponsor, Amber. I'll reach out. Thank you. Yeah, this, is, this is networking live. This is for our you know, participants to see this. That, you know, I was thinking that as you all were sharing that these are connections that you all are making through this webinar. Um, and while you all are in similar fields, you know, I think that I feel too that we're always learning from each other and education and being informed, it never ends. Um, and it certainly, it seems like you three are, you know, uh, really growing in an industry that's evolving. And mm -hmm. I'm curious, you know, if you see any trends within your field that are really moving into a very uh, STEM technology based um, 
you know, focus because all three of you spoke about, you know, the technology that you uh, were a part of or helped build to uh, further, you know, research. And um, if you see that that's a trend, that's obviously a huge focus um, at Ness. Um, and certainly uh, many of our participants are at schools or in programs that are heavily focused in marine science, but also STEM and technology. So I'm curious if we've seen trends in your field since you started and what sort of projections of where you see this going. Yeah, definitely. I can speak to that. We definitely have. I think that science, technology, engineering, and math opens up so many doors for expand of your research or of your interest into new fields and to really take on um, a different perspective. I know that during the pandemic, we weren't able to actually go out and die much as we used to be able to. And so using little ROV that we with you, that was kind of our way to get out, explore the oceans at a time where it wasn't as accessible terms of some of the other ways we were more traditionally do it. And so we're so grateful to have those STEM based schools. And now we love doing it with different school school groups and everyone gets so excited about it because it's a, just another way to um, get access to our environment and learn more about what's happening around us. So I think that's fantastic that you guys are really focusing on that. And I think it's going to really benefit you as you move forward. Yeah, I mean, as as like climate change and biodiversity crises, as these get more and more dire, right, the solutions are where innovation and some of these fields are going to come in, in handy. And there's so much more attention and funding going towards it as people are realizing the importance. So I think like you're coming up at a time that's super exciting in all of that, because everything's a lot more like interdisciplinary like how can we bring in more engineering how can we bring in social sciences um, so that people understand weather warnings better like how can we create better weather warnings that people get right so really connecting the dots between different fields um, a lot of that work is getting way more attention and more interest and like people are seeing the value in it i went from technology to social science i don't know how i got there but there's just a lot, there's a lot of opportunity, whatever your interests are, I think you can find that. Well, great, we have a couple more minutes. So just gonna see if anybody, well, do we have any questions? Anybody from um, the chat box, any questions? I'll just throw in like the advice that I always give is, um, you know, you're probably not going to find your dream job right out of school or right out of college. And if you do, that's amazing. I'm so happy for you. But just know that like I've bounced around a little bit in different aspects, like the ocean is what has connected everything for me, right? You learn a lot about what you don't like, and that's valuable as you're figuring out your career path. So don't be discouraged, you know, if things don't go perfectly in your first job or your second job see what lessons you can learn from that and kind of build from it. For me, I know I just want to be working in something ocean related and giving back to this thing that I really love. And to that point, I think it's also important to make time to enjoy the thing that you love, whether it is related to your work or not. Um, I get out and try and paddleboard or surf or do something um, as much as I can um, to kind of stay grounded in the work that I'm doing. So don't forget to have fun too. Uh, anything from Amber, Emily, any words of wisdom, advice before we close out? Uh, the only thing I was going to add to that, and I love Anupa's advice, because I do think, I mean, like just listening to your presentation, Anupa, I was like, she's had so many cool jobs and they can all relate to each other in all these unique ways. So I think sometimes having a diverse background like that can really help you and really narrow in to find something that you're really passionate about. The only thing I was gonna add is that, um, you know, one of my favorite quotes is that, basically it's about getting education outside of the classroom. 
and that sometimes even if chemistry is not your best subject or math's not your best subject, definitely doesn't mean you can't be a scientist. I'd be the first one to say that math and chemistry were not my best subjects, but today I get to call myself, you know, a marine scientist. So I think don't let those subjects that you may struggle with in school hinder you or turn you off or make you think, oh, I can never pursue this career because there's a lot of opportunities to get to that career and it may not be using you know, biochemistry or mathematics, but there's a lot of ways to carve your own path and strive forward and take other classes that'll help you achieve those same goals. Well, great. Well, I hope that it's okay for me to say that we consider all three of you some pretty fierce marine mavens, and we hope that you'll carry that torch with you, you know, and um, join us as all, we all consider all of ourselves marine mavens. And thank you so much for participating. Um, just been just an epic, you know, afternoon learning from all the panelists and I've learned a lot in my 40s, and <laughs> so I, it's impressive, and this really speaks to your good work, and we'd love to be able to share your contact information with our participants, nice. and if you're able to share um, your slides, we'd love to keep that so that we can refer back to that and really continue to discuss all the great work that you all are doing, and um, again, just Thank you so much. And Sarah, if you have anything that you'd like to add, we do have a general question for our attendees that are on um, regarding just some scheduling aspects. Um, yeah, Anupa, Emily, and Amber, thank you so much. We, Mary and I were jazzed to have you guys um, say yes and be available <laughs> for this. Um, and just like Mary said, I've learned so much and so many like little nuggets of wisdom just listening to you guys present. And it's it's really, really awesome to know that there are such brave, like amazing go-getter women out there fighting for things that are really important. Um, so just want to say thank you from our whole Marine Mavens group again. Yeah. Thanks for having us. I don't know if the panelists can see all the chats, but uh, one of our participants, Caroline, said thanks for sharing with us. You all are amazing. <laughs> so totally agree. Um, and maybe what we'll do, Sarah, is just for our participants in the Marine Mavens, we're going to send out a poll to talk about some April dates. Um, so if you can just be on the lookout for a remind text or email about some scheduling dates for um, our next speaker series, but also as we begin our uh, hands-on experiential learning with power boating, sailing, and kayaking, which is the later half of this Marine Mavens program. So um, for our attendees, just be on the lookout for an email from Sarah and myself about that. And again, thanks so much, Anupa, Emily, Amber. Thanks, attendees, for participating. What a wonderful afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank thanks you. for having us. Bye.